everyone. Uh, as you can see, we're in the professor's classroom here. If you're at the, the first meeting here in March at uh, Cranbrook, Gabe did his Diversity of Galaxies uh, talk, but it was a two-parter all along because he had so much material to present. And, uh, but everybody knows Dave, and uh, I want to give him as much time as possible to present everything. Uh, uh, I gave him a ride here, so he'd give me a little synopsis of what the whole talk's about. I think you're really going to enjoy it. He's in his element, and he has his magic, uh, his dry erase markers, and PowerPoint. So Dave Bailey with the Inner Interacting Galaxies. There it is. All right. Dave. I'm very pleased that it's going to take me more than five minutes to get top off of this dry erase marker. <laughs> Low tech has its advantages. Um, okay. Um, this is going to be in two parts. First part is about this weird thing called dynamical friction. I don't know where they came up with that idea for a name, but it, it's what happens, one of the things that happens when two bunches of stars with millions or billions of stars in a bunch maybe collide with each other. And what happens? Well, they, they interact gravitationally. The stars don't act, hit each other because they're so far apart. And it's a strange and somebody, I guess, the, uh, I came up with a strange name for a strange concept. Um, it's not the strangest. There's another process. You won't believe this one. It's called violent relaxation. <laughs> and uh, I, I have not studied the violent relax. I'm not sure I want to. But it, it's, it's imagine, imagine a, a boxer whose day job is very stressful. So then after hours he goes to the gym and he bars with people, that would be violent relaxation. Oh, I didn't write it up there, but violent relaxation. But anyway, uh, I do not intend to have a talk on violent relaxation anytime soon, because I haven't learned about it yet. Um, okay. Suppose, uh, as I said, suppose a compact clump of stars we're going to call it the intruder, I. And here we've got some subscripts, I. MI means the mass of the intruder clump. DI means the drag exerted on the intruder clump. AI is the deceleration of the intruder clump. Um, and so on. T, on the other hand, stands for target. This is the density of the target. And the target might be a galaxy's disk. It might be a galaxy's central bulge. It might be a galaxy's halo. It's a big thing, a gigantic okay, I thing, typically. I see it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. The intruder might be a single massive star weighing 10 or 20 times as much as the sun. It might be an open cluster weighing 200 times the mass of the sun, like the Hyades cluster, maybe. It might be a blob weighing a million times as much as the sun. Or it might be a dwarf elliptical galaxy, which might weigh 3 billion times the mass of the sun. Or it might be what I call a compact galaxy <coughs> core, which might, might be 1 billion times the mass <coughs> of the sun. Uh, we're going to be talking about compact galaxy cores late in the second part of this presentation, which will be the slideshow. Um, I'll give you a chance to get some get some uh, Z's during the dark period of the. Um, okay. As I said, the objects interact with each other only through gravity. Um, that in turn means that they cannot both have gas and dust. If they both have gas, what happens when they collide? Well, the gas goes like this. Shock waves develop, all kinds of complicated things develop. But we're considering the case where maybe one of the bodies have gas and dust, but not both. No shock waves, etc. So we're t talking about just gravity. The stars are so far apart, star-star collisions, quote, never happen. 
one might occur, so what? Um, okay, dynamical friction drag formula. There it is. That's the drag on the, on the intruder object. C is a dimensionless thing, which we're going to call constant. G is the universal strength of gravity and gravitational constant. M sub I is the mass of the intruder object. Rho sub T is the density of the target. And V sub I is the velocity of the intruder in kilometers per second. And um, if we want the acceleration, it's actually a deceleration because the intruder is going to slow down. All we've got to do is divide by m because we know Newton said force equals mass times acceleration. So we eliminate one of those m's. That's the only difference between these two, mi, not mi, squared. Okay, we'll come back to that. Here's what happens, how it works. Here is, I guess, a, give this a, a thickness. This is, what do they call it? I don't know. I don't know why they called it. Doesn't matter. I'll call it L for the thickness, the length, sub T. This is the thickness of the disk of a galaxy, say. So this is going to be like thousands of light years in the case of a disk of a galaxy. Here is the intruder mass. It's moving through. Here's its velocity, v sub i. Here's the drag on it, d sub i. Where did the drag come from? Well, see all these stars here. Those are stars that are members of the target, the galaxy in this case. OK. What happens? Well, this one starts to accelerate this way because it feels the gravity of this oncoming object. This one is accelerated this way, and it's turned a little bit, and it's, now its velocity is that way. And it's, it's trying to fall towards the heavy object there. These here, they cross each other like this. That one's going like that. That one's going like that. They're still going. Um, they don't feel much acceleration farther farther this one goes, they, they feel less and less force, but they've made a clump here. As it says here, mass accumulates here. Then what happens? Well, there's a massive thing there, and it pulls that way on the intruder object. Yeah, but it can't be that much. No, it isn't. And it's only, it only, it's only effective as it's receding from the target. That's right. And it only pulls that way. It never pulls the target that way, which is interesting. Um, OK. Um, this clump may be closer. It may be like a tailgating vehicle. It may be way back here, depending on the velocity of the, of the intruder. And also, of course, the clump depends on the mass of the intruder. Um, here's some assumptions we're going to go by, and eventually we're going to violate some of them, or at least one. We're going to assume that the mass, that, excuse me, we're going to assume the velocity of the intruder is large compared to VT. What's VT? VT is the little small velocities that each star has in some, in some random direction. You know, stars aren't all uh, lined up in a row and not moving. They are have velocities. And this velocity is big. This little velocity here is a vt, target velocity of a star, a uh, velocity of a target star, vt. Those are small compared to that velocity. Um, rho sub i is the density of the impactor, of the, of the intruder. You can't call it impactor because there's no collisions. Um, that's large. This thing is a clump. That's quite a bit of quite a bit of mass, and the clump is small, so it has a large density. Its density is large compared to the 
density of the target, which has these target stars which are spread out over many, many, many light years. And the mass of the, of the intruder is m sub i, is very small compared to the mass of the target. Hey Dave, can yeah. I ask a question? Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. When you have something like that, where you got a massive intruder yeah. and a much lesser mass target, could the roles actually be reversed? Where you have where you have yeah. the target is really the intruder. Yeah. yeah, maybe so, maybe so. But we're considering the case where we've got a small but very dense intruder, and we've got a large but very sparse target, and the target does have a lot more mass than the intruder. For example, the intruder could be a globular cluster, the target could be the disk of a galaxy, or even the halo of a galaxy. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that I don't get too eager to go that way. I've got to go on the paper as well. Um, okay. I guess I've covered everything there. Okay. Um, let's go over here. No, let's not. Not yet. Not yet. <coughs> Now, just as a side thing, what happens in the wake of this thing that came through, so without warning, let's say, um, as you would expect, if the intruder passes through some interstellar gas and dust clouds, which are just below the critical mass for collapse, they may start to collapse. As you can see what happened, a bunch of this stuff has been pushed together. If there's gas and dust here, it also got pushed together. We're talking gravity here. Gravity applies just as much to a hydrogen atom as it does to a star that weighs 20 times as much as the sun. They will accelerate just the same. They will get concentrated here just the same. This thing may collapse and then eventually end up producing stars. That's how they used it. How they used it. Hmm? And that's the process that they're made, isn't it? Um, there's a lot more things that can cause collapse than, than just a, an intruder coming through. But I think, especially with globular clusters, I think it's as important. Um, do I hear the word, is the word trigger? I hate the word trigger. Huh? If, if I stomp on a cockroach, I did not trigger its death. I killed it. <laughs> Don't use the word trigger unless you really mean trigger. Um, but in this case, yeah, um, that thing could collapse. What determines whether it collapses? Oh, only really half a dozen things. If conditions are favorable, cloud size, cloud density, cloud temperature, transparency. If it's transparent, you can get rid of energy by radiating the energy away. If the cloud is opaque, it's very hard to form stars from an opaque cloud. Interesting. The magnetic field. Is this too much magnetic field? Then you got a problem. Internal wind currents. If you got a lot of motion here, major, major wind storms in different directions, then, then it's almost impossible to form stars. But we're not in the business of star formation right now, so let's go on. But it's an interesting aside. Um, <coughs> All right, let's go back to the formula. Um, some of this is going to make sense. Some will not make sense, at least at first. Um, the drag force on the intruder is proportional to the target density, basically the number of stars per cubic light year. Let's suppose all the stars have a mass of half the mass of the sun, <coughs> which is sort of typical for red dwarfs. There's way more red dwarfs than anything else. Okay, if you double the density, you double the drag. Okay, that's common sense. Next, everybody who has studied aerodynamics knows that drag is proportional to the square of the velocity, right? And sure enough, there it is, vi squared. But look again, it's in the denominator. The drag is 
inversely proportional to the square of the velocity? This is very counterintuitive, but it's true. Because there's more time for it to interact with Yeah. This, uh, this clump, instead of being here, is way back here. Less drag. It's farther away. Gravity is inverse square law. This is twice as far back. The gravity is one quarter as much on the intruder object. OK, so we have to forget everything we knew about aerodynamics. Faster you go, less drag. All right. Three, everybody knows that a more massive intruder will decelerate less. Hey, it's more massive, of course. It carries through and it doesn't decelerate much. Not true. Take a look. Let's look at the acceleration, deceleration. There is m sub i, the mass of the intruder. It's in the numerator. If the intruder weighs a thousand times more, it decelerates a thousand times faster. Is this counterintuitive for what? It's counterintuitive. Um, uh, over here, I'm going to put some uh, references in case somebody wants to convince himself that this could possibly be true. Um, next, everybody knows that a narrow, pointy intruder will penetrate the vest. <clears throat> Not true. These equations don't say it explicitly, but a wide thin, flat intruder penetrates much better. Imagine that you're at attacking a concrete wall with two implements. First, use a nail gun. You go, bam. The nail, it's a heavy nail. It's sharp. It's pointed. It penetrates, but not far. Now, the counterintuitive part. I get a supermarket coupon. It's printed on very lightweight paper, and I throw it flat against the concrete wall as fast as I can and go that. The supermarket coupon goes right through the concrete wall and out the other side. No damage to the concrete, no damage to the paper. We're talking gravity here. Stars don't collide. Counterintuitive? You bet. Why is a spread out thing? more penetrating because what counts here is that this thing is localized. This thing produces a well-defined blob. If it's this big, it produces a blob, but the blob is all spread out. And in particular, the part of the blob that's caused by this mass here doesn't affect much the mass here. Strange but true. Um, this is not to scale. I could probably draw it. To, if I tr try draw, drawing it several times, I could get it to, to be more convincing looking. OK. <coughs> Next question. If the intruder is moving slowly, where does it stop? How far does it go? Turns out that it's stopping distance is proportional to the fourth power of its initial velocity. Time into the diagram. Here the velocity goes from zero, well, that's why it stopped. Uh, I'm thinking in re reverse here. Let's say at this time here, the velocity is one, and the distance before it stops is one. This is distance. I've shown it in reverse direction because the object is coming in from this side and then slowing down and stopping. And its velocity starts at 2 and it slows down and ends at velocity 0. <coughs> um, if you double the velocity, like instead of velocity 1, which is what you got at that instant there, you got velocity 2. The distance, the stopping distance is 16 times greater 
and I drew in a couple other dots which are more or less correct. I want you to be closer to the line. A little closer. So you can see that the distance, the penetration that this goes before this is, goes before it stops, uh, is very dependent on the initial velocity. If I made this velocity <coughs> four, then it would have to go out to four cubed. Is what have I got? Oh, well, sixteen times that. Two hundred and fifty-six. Anyway, we go a long, long distance before it stops. Hey, Dave, wouldn't the yeah. stopping distance also be determined by the mass of the target? Of course, the density of the target. So, but the density is it yeah. always going to be four times. Or but other things being equal, you know, and just trying to show you how the, the dependency <coughs> on different variables. <coughs> um, okay. However. If we go back to the deceleration formula, you can see that as the velocity leads off, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the deceleration is going to go towards infinity. It's like a car trying to stop and the brakes keep get, getting better and better and better and pretty soon things start to break on the, on the structure of the car. Something is wrong here. What's wrong is, eventually we violate one of these assumptions. And in particular, we violate the assumption that the velocity of the intruder is large compared to the velocity of the target stars. Vi is <coughs> greater than Vt. When the target has slowed down from that velocity down to that velocity, it's no longer going really fast compared to the target stars. And the pull analysis collapses. You've got to start over again with new math. That's OK. Until that happens, the analysis was correct. And it does really, the penetrating distance, the stopping distance, really does depend on the fourth power of the velocity. OK. Now let's look again at the masses of possible intruder objects. I mentioned a few of them. Let's look at three of them. A globular cluster weighs a million. An open cluster like the Hyades weighs 200 times the mass of the sun. I could put m sun, m sun, m sun. And the velocity of a massive, uh, the mass of a massive star might be 10 times the mass of the sun. Um, deceleration. Well, it's the inverse of the mass, there, where it says A, the, the, the equation that starts with an A. So, if a globular cluster decelerates that fast, an open cluster like the Hyades decelerates that fast, which is hardly decelerates at all. And this massive star decelerates even slower than that. This is that same thing where I slapped a supermarket coupon against the wall and it went right through the wall because it hardly decelerated at all. It didn't weigh anything. So it's very interesting. It has some implications. Um, in particular, each galaxy seems to have a kind of a mass limit for its globular clusters. And it, the mass limit can be different for each galaxy because the the parameters of the galaxy are different. It's the, the density of stars, et cetera. The random velocities of the stars in the galaxy are different. Um, so globs that have too much mass decelerate way too fast. Every time a glob goes through the disk of a galaxy, it slows down. <coughs> the more mass the glob has, the more it slows down, because we saw that. So every galaxy has a maximum mass for globular clusters. What happens to the globs that exceeded that mass? They stopped, first of all. They stopped within the disk, and they fell. Where'd they fall? They fall in the, into the core of the galaxy. And we have, an, a gal uh, in the, our own galaxy, we have 
a glob that is suspiciously massive, which is Omega Centauri. And it may be that Omega Centauri is beyond the limit for our galaxy, and it's just by chance it hasn't had yet any major collisions with the disk. Or it may be that it's a new, a, a newly captured glob. It may be it originated in some other galaxy. But it's interesting to, to see that massive things tend to accumulate in the cores of galaxies. Um, where am I at? All right. Um, what will these things that I'm thinking about showing you later in the presentation, what will they look like? I'm calling them compact galaxy cores. Basically, a compact galaxy core is what happens if you take an ordinary normal galaxy and you strip off the spiral arms. Then you strip off the disk, parts of the disk that don't have spiral arms, strip them off. Then you strip off the outer core, the outer part of the core. You end up with just a compact galaxy core. And in astrophotos, they will resemble star images, but maybe slightly fuzzy or not quite round. Uh, you people who have done astrophotography could probably find a bunch of them on your astrophotos. Just but they're still way bigger than globular clusters, right? Uh, some of them could be large globular. You'll, you'll see some, some stuff in the second part of the presentation. And so, yeah, any, any star image that looks sort of suspicious. Maybe it's a little fuzzy. Maybe it's not quite round. Um, most of them will be yellow or orange since they have no gas or dust and therefore they have no young stars. Um, but they don't have gas and dust because things happen down there in the course of galaxies. Uh, star formation occurs real fast, uses up the gas and dust real quick. Um, they won't be very bright and they may go unnoticed in photos unless you deliberately look for them. So they're small, they're dense and dim. They remind you of white dwarf stars, don't they? They have nothing to do with white dwarf stars, but they have in common that they're small, dense, and dim compared to other things of the same type. Okay. The rule of thumb for star density in the core region of a galaxy such as the Milky Way is that the number of stars within a small sphere is proportional to the radius of the sphere. This, of course, means that a smaller sphere is much denser than a larger sphere. And so here I'm showing you Bible statistics of some arbitrarily designed typical core regions. Here we got a sphere radius of one. Now we've got one that's half as big, a quarter as big, and an eighth as big. We're focusing on smaller and smaller and smaller parts of the core region of a galaxy. The sphere volume is, in this case, it's one. Here, that is one eighth, which is a cube of one hand. One sixty fourth, one five hundred twelfth. The star count, the mass, according to the rule of thumb, star count just goes along with the radius. So, radius of one, star count of one in some units. Half as much mass in the case of half a sphere, half the radius, one quarter, one eighth. The density. Well, the density is the mass divided by the volume. So in this case, we get density of 1, density of 4, 16, or 64. So the closer you go to the core of a galaxy and calculate densities based on the radius of the sphere you're looking at and the volume and the mass, the closer you get to the center core of a galaxy, the more stars you've got per cubic light year. And it's dramatic in this case, 1 <coughs> versus 64. Escape velocity, that you can calculate from the radius and the mass. It's going to be the same for all of these, assuming that, you, that the rule of thumb, that the star count goes with, along with the radius, assuming that that is adhered to, the escape velocity is the same for all of these. 
Um, the gravity gradient required to disrupt the core tidally is 1, 2, 4, and 8. That means that a compact galaxy core is pretty damn near indestructible. It's small, it's dense, it's got strong self-gravity. You can't, can't hurt it. It's like a nucleus of an atom in chemistry. In chemistry, a nucleus of an atom is indestructible. It's small, <coughs> it's dense, it's got strong forces in it. With ordinary chemistry, you can't touch it. Very interesting. Um, the density, as I mentioned, the density goes as the inverse square of the radius. Yeah, I, I didn't use the word inverse square, but you can see that that's the case. 1 8, 64. Um, the size of a compact galaxy core will depend on its history. A long and violent history <coughs> will strip away more of the outer parts, leaving a smaller, denser core. Now, how about some actual numbers? The galactic astronomers have tried hard to learn about the core of our own Milky Way, <coughs> even though it cannot be clearly seen in ordinary visible light. There's other things you can do, radio, infrared, uh, other things you can do to look into the core of uh, our galaxy. It appears that the star density rule of thumb, <coughs> that <coughs> those numbers go along with those numbers, that rule of thumb applies fairly well from about five light years radius out to maybe a thousand light years. Beyond a thousand, the galaxy gradually looks, looks more like a disk and less like a sphere. A sphere of 700 light years appears to contain 1.6 billion solar masses, and a seven light year sphere has a mass of seven million. Now that statistic is pretty impressive. A seven light year sphere centered on our sun contains only the Alpha Centauri system plus Barnard star. Four stars total. Imagine seven million stars instead of four stars. How bright would our sky, night sky be with seven, with, what did I say, seven million Alpha Centauris within seven light years of us? Uh, would would any of us be doing any deep sky observing? We're sleeping. So we should remember, though, that our own galaxy may not be entirely typical. The Andromeda system is an example. It seems atypical in some ways. Down in their core regions, would you believe M32 may be a larger galaxy than M31? M31 is this giant thing, and M32 <coughs> is this little blob down in the core, so I am told, M32 looks like it's a bigger galaxy than M31. Now this may be history. It may be that uh, at one time M32 was the most massive galaxy in our local group. It may be that it got into some fights with other galaxies and lost those fights. Maybe most of its material is stripped off to go into probably M31. Um, you know, when you have a a collision or other close approach of, of two galaxies, the more massive one may not always win. It may be that M32 just basically lost a bunch of close encounters because of the details of the configuration. Like one galaxy is like that and the other one is like that. You bring them together like this, well, obviously it's not going to be a draw. One of them is going to lose more mass than, than the other. I don't know which, but it's not going to be obviously. It, it's not obvious that this is a, a, an even match of two galaxies collide like this. <coughs> OK. This says I've used 15 minutes. I think I've used more than that. 34. Time to go. Time to go. Let's go. <laughs> Second you half. Start with your first. Let's kill the uh, lights. And I'll see if I can get a. Uh, Okay. Does this thing work? Up. It works. Okay, let's go. Oh well, let's take a look at the what we're going to be looking at. Optical interactions. This is where the galaxies don't actually touch each other. Light from one galaxy passes near the other. Here's wind interactions. That's where gas 
hits gas. Gravitational interactions, this is the big thing. And compact force, let's go. Okay, here is a case of gravitational lensing. There is a very distant galaxy, that red thing. It doesn't look like a galaxy. It's distorted because of the gravity of the galaxies here. Um, if we knew the exact location and mass of each of these galaxies, we would be able to undistort that image and get a good, clear image of what that galaxy behind there actually looks like. Go. Here's an Einstein's cross. In this case, the distant galaxy is a quasar. And yeah, I have a better picture than that, but we couldn't get it for this uh, presentation. Um, it's clear in the other picture that this is a barred spiral galaxy. Mm. And it's about that big. Mm. And uh, here's four images of the distant quasar. They've been refracted by gravitational uh, bending. Um, it proves that uh, Einstein was right. Uh, general theory of relativity is true. Um, before Einstein, uh, there was also gravitational bending of light. But Einstein said it's twice what Newton would have thought. Nobody ever asked Newton. But it was, it's twice what New, Newton would have thought. And it's also twice what Einstein thought in his special theory. Go. OK. Here we've got, uh, we use this picture in the first part of the first show. Um, here is um, the large Magellanic cloud. Looks like a barred spiral with maybe arms sticking out there. There is a, a truly irregular uh, galaxy. Um, <coughs> we know that those galaxies have not passed through the disk of our own galaxy much. Why? Because they still got uh, quite a bit of gas and, and some dust. They passed through our galaxy more than, maybe more than once or twice. They wouldn't have any gas and dust left. Uh, interesting. Go. No? OK, here we got M110, and here we got M32. Those are dwarf, uh, dwarf ellipticals. We know that those galaxies have passed through the disk of M31. How, why, how do we know? Because they don't have any gas and dust. Um, Sure. All right, that's fine. Cool, that's cool. You go. Um, there we see a compact galaxy core. Um, I've got another picture of it that shows a much smaller core than that. This, this, this part here is overexposed in this, in this particular image. And notice this uh, galaxy has some dust there and there. Um, we have decided that uh, dwarf ellipticals are not allowed to have <coughs> dust. For some reason, the, that chord order never got to this galaxy. It's got some dust. Uh, go. Oh, there's, there's the, another one. That's that, the one you want. There's the, there's the two blobs of, of, of dust. And there is a suspiciously strange looking star image. It took me a long time to convince myself that that wasn't actually a star image, which just happens to be at the core of the image of that galaxy. I think that really is the core of the galaxy. And um, if we compare it to another star image like that one, it doesn't, to my eye, it doesn't look quite identical. Or this one. Um, I'm trying to, I'm having a hard time finding a really good comparable there. Um, go. Okay, this is interesting. Um, here we've got two galaxies colliding, apparently, and one of them is has almost <coughs> all of the light, and the other one has almost all of the gas. Uh, excuse me, of the dust. We're seeing the dust here, and the classic description of this is that it's a disk galaxy in collision with, or recently absorbed by, a, an elliptical galaxy, a giant elliptical. I disagree. This has to be not a giant elliptical, but rather an SO galaxy. An SO galaxy is a disk galaxy which has no arms. How do I know it's a disk? Look at this sharp edge here. The dust ends along this sharp edge. That means that there is dust. This, this 
our lane of dust ex extends farther. But beyond here, it's behind the stars. You can't see dust if it's behind the stars, only if it's in front. And that sharpness of that cutoff indicates to me that that's a disk galaxy. Go. OK, here we've got two galaxies. Which one is in front? The big one. How do we know? We can see the dust. It has to, that dust has to be in front of this galaxy. Could possibly be behind it. Um, and uh, let's see, there's some um, blue recently formed stars. Population one, there's population two, yellow, yellow, go. You also have the rotating clockwise the wrong way you were mentioning. Oh yeah, no. cool, thank you. Sure. Um, Notice this thing. It looks like a it looks like a bar, and right at the end of the bar, there's a little hook there and a little hook there. It looks like a little bit of spiral structure. That spiral structure, if we take it seriously, means that that part of the galaxy is rotating this way, but the outer part is rotating that way. We counter rotating parts of a single galaxy. That is found uh, uh, commonly among uh, giant uh, ellipticals. This, in this case, it's found in what looks like a more normal spiral. Go. Interesting. Uh, in this case, we can see some deformation. Uh, this part in here looks like an ordinary spiral arm. This part here is no longer spiraling. It's going outwards. This stuff out here is out of there. It's gone. It's not coming back. It's probably going like that. It, it, that greater than escape velocity. Um, in there is maybe a compact core. <coughs> it's pretty small. It looks sort of like a large star image. Um, here we've got some uh, <coughs> starburst going on there. Some of that starburst may be uh, due to the presence of that <coughs> other galaxy. Likewise, the starburst there may be due to the presence of that other galaxy. Maybe this might, that might be starburst, but it's suspiciously yellow. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe the, maybe there was a starburst there, but it wasn't like 10 million years ago. It was more like 150 million years ago, or something well, like they, that. They quoted here about 40, somewhere between 40 million and 100 million. Is what you said. That's the time when these are approached close to each That's other. That's right. We're at okay. 40 million. You said. Five. Go. Go. Yeah, go. This is called the mice, <coughs> and. Um, there's a lot of interesting things you can say about this. Um, I'll, I'll just say, notice the difference between ongoing star formation and recent star formation. This is ongoing star formation. It's blue and clumpy. This is recent star formation. It's fuzzy and white. Stars don't stay where they're formed. They gradually spread out. And in this case, they spread out enough to make themselves look fuzzy. And there's clumpy, so that's ongoing star formation. Go. <laughs> now this one, the uh, I'm not sure whether this boxer has won or lost a fight, but this one <laughs> seems to be going down for the count. Um, you should have seen the other guy. What's that? You said you should have seen the other guy. Oh yeah, you can read the whole quote if you like. It says. Um, what that mice collision might have looked like when asked what it was like to get hit so hard, the boxer responded, you should have seen the other guy. He was off the frame and to the right, going down. And these athletes do not wear helmets. No, they don't wear helmets. Um, can anybody see a, um, a compact galaxy core? Yeah. I think it's right there. Yeah. It's yellow. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the size of a star image. And it has been totally untouched by this violent occurrence. And here we've got star formation. Uh, well, let's go on to the next. Uh, this is called the tadpole. And again, um, for, for a long time, years, I looked at this picture and said, can't they get that galaxy in focus? All this stuff here is way out of focus. It never occurred to me to look at all the background galaxies, which are sharp 
as nails. And that's out of focus because that's former star formation. And it's, well, this is kind of blue, but, but uh, it's, it's whiter than that. <coughs> anyway, that's recent star formation. Go. Now, here is the smoking gun that shows you that maybe there is something to this uh, compact galaxy core thing. Um, we got this thing, which I claim is the gainer. This galaxy had been soaking up material from these other ones. And it's got strange things in addition to this triple dust lane. Uh, look at the <coughs> central bulge. It doesn't have a central bulge. It has an X-shaped bulge. And I think this galaxy has three disks. The main disk is here. It's got a disk there. It's got a disk there. This disk is suspiciously parallel to the structure of that. This disk here is suspiciously parallel to the structure of that. That is commonly thought to be a member of this cluster. I don't think so. I think that's a giant elliptical which is in the background, or maybe the foreground. But if it's a couple million light years closer or farther away, it's not part of this cluster. Um, I think and that one is traditionally thought to be a background object because it's small. No, it's small because it's lost most of its arms and part of its, part of its disk. Here's what I think has happened. This galaxy is substantially unchanged. Well, maybe it's, well, it's, it's awful fuzzy out here. So it may have lost a good bit of its outer disk arm structure. <coughs> this one has lost almost all of its arm structure, but look at the central portion. There is what looks like a compact galaxy core, and there it is, and those two are essentially identical looking. There is a piece of disk with the, without much arms. There is a piece of disk with, and it's the same size as that piece of disk that doesn't have the, the arms. There is some arms which are little stubs of these big arms. Okay, so this one has gotten into more fights with big, big guy here than that one has. What about this one? Well, that one is one that looks identical to that one and that one, except that it's lost all of its arms. There is the compact core of the galaxy, and there is a little bit of disk with no arms. And that part looks awful lot look like the, very much like that, that's what it looks. Okay, can we go farther? Yeah. That one's lost all of its disk. And part of its core, arguably, because it's, it's considerably dimmer than that core there. I think that is a compact galaxy core. Um, checking the redshift of it would tell us. These stars, these stars, if those are star images, they have a redshift that's way different from these galaxies. I bet that one has the same redshift as <coughs> that, 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 and that. Um, go. There's Omega Centauri, uh, the one which I thought was too massive to last long in the, in the Milky Way's uh, environment. Um, what would a compact core look like? Well, some numbers that I rather arbitrar or arbitrarily assigned to a compact core says that if we made that image 13 times wider, that is over there and over there, and 13 times taller, with the star density the same as what we see here. That's what a compact core of a galaxy would look like. Okay, go. Uh, 47 Tucani, another rather large, massive, uh, I don't have the stats for this one, but uh, such pretty galaxy that, uh, you know, um, Ken and I couldn't resist using it as well. Go. Okay, this is very interesting. Um, this is called the disk galaxy, and its name is the cartwheel. And the traditional um, attempted, attempted interpretation <coughs> is that one of those two galaxies had a more or less a bullseye collision with this, causing that disk to be 
splattered out into space, and that disk may be splattered into space, and that one there likewise splattered, and, and so on, and these arms, who knows what those things are about. And nobody uh, has been able to figure out which one was the intruder, and nobody's been able to figure out why these didn't get mangled so badly as that. I think I have a solution. Those are not part of this cluster. Those are either considerably closer to the Earth or considerably farther from the Earth. I think this got hit by a compact galaxy core. Where is it? You can probably spot it. There it is. Hmm. Dave, have you ever seen a square-shaped galaxy before? Square? Well, that one there is square. Look at the... No, no, the, the, the red one. The red one. Well, the square, too. Yeah, that's that square. Bit, yeah. Now this one is square. Yeah. Actually, there is a terminology called a boxy galaxy, but it's applied to ellipticals. Um, anyway, the interesting thing in here is, we would expect if this is uh, if to find an intruder um, lined up with the disks. We got an elliptical disk here. Its major axis points there to about half past half past six. This one here points to like there, and there it is. Uh, again, um, radial velocity, red redshift would tell us whether that's a galaxy which is more or less the same distance away as that. Um, if it has the same um, redshift as that star image, then then I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, go. Got five minutes left, Dan. Yeah, she eats by. Yeah. Um, here's another ring galaxy. Um, this one is so symmetrical. It, it doesn't even have elliptical rings. And it's got some stuff out there, and it's got some dark area there, and it's got some stuff in there, and it's got dark area. And you could use it, that picture as a bullseye for a shooting competition. And he was saying, he was saying that the site of galaxy, which it is, probably was dead center. Dead center and, both, both, both dead center and at 90 degrees. Right. Both of those things probably. So where is the intruder galaxy? Well, there's two of them. There's one there and there's one there. Hmm. I, I, I tend to favor this one. Hmm. Uh, and the last picture, this is Hoag's <laughs> object. Wow. Hogue discovered, I think his name is Art, Art Hogue. He discovered this in uh, 1950 or so. And at first, he did, and people argued that can't be a galaxy. That's some kind of planetary nebula. But no, it's a galaxy, all right. And very, very pop two there. Very, very pop one there. You know, bluish, bluish white, and definitely yellow. Um, an amazing thing. And this is like a, how many can there be like that? That's like one in a million, right? You know what a galaxy <coughs> looks like, and it doesn't look like that. So this is a one in a million thing. But look at this. Yeah. <coughs> Another ring galaxy inside the ring of this one. And some people say, oh, well, that's just a, a chance alignment. Well, how stupid can they be? If this is one in a million and that's one in a million, then the chance of both of them like that is one in a trillion. Not a one in a billion, one in a trillion. That's not a chance alignment. That is the intruder. That is the compact galaxy core. Uh, it's a little bit soft, and so when it crashed into, and it probably went right through the, right through that core. Otherwise, why would this be so much so so circular and symmetrical? And since it's a little bit soft, it made its own little mini ring. So, um, can we get some lights? How are we doing on time? We got time for about three, two or three questions. Them. I've got one. Do you yeah. think that Omega Centauri is a ca the core of a captured galaxy? I think so, and I'm, I, I even wonder whether maybe all globs are original galaxy cores, and they would have been <coughs> cores of dwarf spirals. I claim 
not all cosmologists agree, I'm sure. I claim that all galaxies started out as dwarf spirals back when the universe was, I don't know, a billion years old or something. They were all dwarf spirals and maybe, you know, here's our own galaxy today. And here's a typical dwarf spiral, you know, like that, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than that. There's a dwarf spiral. How would you make that out of some of those? Easy. Just crash a hundred of those together and you got one like that. So that would explain why we have like a hundred loves. A hundred dwarf spirals went into the formation of our Milky Way. Is there also a factor that's involved with the fact that, the, that many of the globulars are mostly made up of red dwarfs? Being their age and such. Well, yeah, that tells you uh, that They've it tells you two things. One is that either either they're very old, or something strange has happened happened in the star formation process, and massive stars were never ever formed, because if there were even a few massive stars formed and they were the globs were young, then we'd still see some traces of them. We would see. Supernova remnants, mm -hmm. we would see red supergiants, we would see uh, Wolf Ray stars, we'd see planetary nebulas, well, more. I mean, you do see planetaries, but those are Not from, often. They're from stars like the, like sun. the sun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, when you look at pictures of, like you have here, and you go back like a hundred years, to the old astronomers, do the pictures look the same? No, because their photography techniques were not as good. Well, yeah, okay, but I mean, um, do the shapes look the same? Oh, um, well, there was a guy who measured the rotation rate of M101. <coughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure. A well known galaxy, face on galaxy, he saw it turning. It was 31. It was, um... In his lifetime? And, yeah, yeah. Um, he was quite very wrong. And he was wrong. Yeah, he was wrong. And von Manen? No, I don't think so. Not Adrian um, von, it's, it's Adrian von Manen? Here. It's in this book here. Um, so they essentially look the same with the long time we've had to look at them? We can't see any motion, no. We can see fore and aft motion. Because we got a red shift of uh, the galaxy moving away from us, and we got a blue shift of the galaxy moving towards us. But we can't, we can't see any motion in the sideways directions. Uh, and, uh, the yeah. Doesn't change. Oh. <coughs> yeah, a, a picture of a galaxy taken 200 years ago would look the same, except they didn't have to this then. Yeah. Really, they'll. Go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in what scenario would two spiral galaxies. Uh, <coughs> passing through each other, uh, come back together to form an elliptical, elliptical compared to uh, just passing through and interacting with each other. What, what causes the... Uh, oh, the well, it depends on how much they slow down. Right. Yeah. Um, and if they've, got, if they've got a huge amount of, you know, escape velocity, then they will pass through each other and keep on going and never come back again. Um, but portions of them will come back because the, the outer parts are the outer parts of the spiral arms are bound to the main galaxy much weaker than the inner parts of the uh, spiral arms, just because gravity is stronger, you know, closer to the center. Yeah? Has anybody done computer simulations? Or? Lots. Yes. <laughs> I've done some, uh, but, but the software I've got is, you know, ancient compared to what is being done now. Um, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that Adrian von Manen was the guy who thought he saw Andromeda spinning. But Andromeda. The the main changes that we would see in galaxies in human time would be if supernovae appear. Yes. So we can see that, but that's about it. Um, I know that at least two people had that kind of. Um, well, it's like the else on Mars. You know. At least two people mm -hmm. did that because in the book I've got there, the galaxy had a one in front of it. It was. 102 or something like that. And well, it was a key so piece of evidence people. on whether or not galaxies were located inside the Milky Way. Yes, yes. And, you know, uh, just as some people would like Mars to have 
inhabitants. Other people would like to have little spirals of our own in our own Milky Way. Okay, Brian, last question. Um, you mentioned how uh, the chances of stars themselves colliding when you have two galaxies come to it. Yeah. Uh, would it be much more likely that you could have two stars going into orbit around each other? Yes. How often does that happen? The way it would happen is that you, you've got three stars coming together, or, or four, let's make it three. And if the details of the gravity there throws one of the two stars like totally out of the picture at really high speed, the other two can end up orbiting each other. If that doesn't happen, they will not orbit each other. The, the three will come close and then the three will go apart again. But stars do collide all the time. But they don't collide because they started in different galaxies and hit each other. They collide because they were formed in the same part, in the same subpart of the same star forming region. They started, they started out as binary stars and then they can spiral inwards by a number of different ways. That's the way, that's the way stars collide. Um, one major way stars collide is they start well separated and then one of them turns into a supergiant and its outer layers go out and engulf the satellite star. It then spirals around and keeps on orbiting inside the atmosphere of the other star for a surprising amount of time and then gradually spirals closer and closer and closer and closer. So that's the way stars collide in real life. So uh, it's, more, it's, it's, it's less likely that they would actually collide, but it's more likely that they would go into orbit around each other. Yeah, and think. even that is pretty unlikely, because as I said, you really need three stars to achieve that. Okay. All right, so it's 9.33. Um, the, so mm -hmm. let's uh, give our speaker a round of applause. Okay. Will you be going to the Coney? Will you be going to the Coney? I'll, only if I can find a ride to the north from here. Okay, so I, if... I got a ride to the north, but the, my, rider, my driver is not going to the Coney. Gotcha. So if you would like to continue this uh, conversation at your leisure, the man needs a ride to the Coney and then home. No. Well, home. Specifically. I could walk to the Coney. That's no yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would just take a while. Um, so we'll anyway, we do go to the Coney um, on tw Van Dyke just north of 12 Mile. Uh, so please take snacks and pop because um, don't think any of that will still be fresh for the Cranbrook meeting. And I don't want to take it all home. Um, so please, please uh, grab you some snacks on the way out the door. Everybody have a safe drive. And we will see you all in Cranbrook. So uh, everybody is volunteering for a ride for us?